Hello and uh, welcome to part two-ish, I, I guess, like follow-up number two of my ramblings, shall we say, series. Uh, more or less just, I have kind of an idea to use this as a, uh, the ramblings as a uh, kind of just an opportunity to go through my thought process and just talk about really whatever, I, I suppose. <laughs> There's not really much of a specific outline. But what I did really want to talk about today was something that recently occurred to me, I think over the past week, I think would be fair to say. I'm um, just watching some of the content creators on both YouTube and Minds.com, as well as a few other places, just kind of watching them partially piece together the puzzle, shall we say, um, or at least put a really good inroad into something I really want to explore now, which is... What is it with more or less social justice, but also obviously feminism, which falls into that area? What is it with social justice, particularly its adherence, and their continual search for whatever it is they're looking for, whether it's misogyny, racism, sexism, prejudice, discrimination, homophobia, Islamophobia, the list goes on and on and on and on, and I think you all get the point. But it really comes down to the interest of why do they seem to have this almost fetish, shall we say, for lack of a better word, on just finding things that they can deem unsocially just. I won't say unjust because social justice is not justice. There's a reason why you have the prefix social in front, um, because it's not legal quantifiable objective justice, it's all subjective and relative, but anyway, that's inherencies to cultural Marxism and more or less modern liberalism. But once again, back to the point, these people's like obsession with continually finding something to be pissed off about or finding how something must be racist or must be wrong. The current incident in Melbourne, Australia is an excellent example of this where they're currently in the process of changing all the crosswalk lights and even information signs for the crosswalks into female figures, or at least some of them. I don't know if they're doing all of them. I haven't quite looked into all of it, but I do understand that it's to fight unconscious sexism uh, in street traffic control signs, which is beyond fucking retarded, let's be clear. But uh, it, it really points to the fact that they take what is actually supposed to be gender neutral, because the stick person is gender neutral. It can be anyone. It, it could be male, it could be female, it could be conservative, it could be Republican, which is kind of doing the same, but not quite. It could be Democrat, it could be communist for all I care, it could be fascist, it could be their next Hitler. Stick people are generally speaking gender neutral, um, at least in the modern context. The only place they really become gendered is like washrooms. And even then, thanks to Target and transphobia, that's not exactly true either anymore. But uh, anyway, the point is, when we take a look at this, there's just this obsession with taking the smallest, most innocent thing that most people would never construe as sexist because it's obviously not. It's not even supposed to be unconsciously or benevolently sexist. It's literally not sexist at all. And they take these things and they complain about them as if there's some massive issue like traffic control signs being some massive impact. How many people even walk in Melbourne, Australia in the freaking first place to even see the goddamn signs? I don't think that many people really do. Uh, but obviously, I haven't been to Australia, so I don't really know. But I know here in Canada, mind that, it's like minus 13 today. Uh, not, not too popular of an activity, let's just put it that way. But anyway, just trying to find something to pick on and get upset about, it starts to become slightly more disturbing as time goes on because most people take a look at this and like, oh, they're just grasping at straws. They're just a bunch of lunatics, you know, they're, well, which they are, but they're grasping at straws, you know, they're, they're coming to an end. I have a theory they're actually really not. They might be coming to an end on the legitimacy spectrum, like outsiders looking at this and being like, uh, yeah, you might want to get your head checked, my friend. But for them, I think they're really actually reaching the epitome where they no longer need to focus on actual issues in order for there to be a problem. They can focus on actual reality itself. So they're no longer just random social constructs, but reality itself and use social constructs 
to actually explain why things that aren't sexist, racist, or discriminatory, or aren't socially unjust in any way, are socially unjust, sexist, and discriminatory, and racist. And any one of many phobias that they love throwing out. And this really shows kind of a solidification of their ideology. It's becoming, in a way, shall we say, compatible, or at least formatable with reality, in a way that they can utilize it so they can do Anita Sarkeesian's famous quote, or shall we say infamous quote, which is, you know, sexism is everywhere. You just need to look for it. And that's essentially what this is. This is their kind of finalization of ideology. It's applying this idea of essentially cultural Marxism to everything, everything, and looking for problems. And to them, looking for a problem is not like how many people consider looking for a problem. You know, oh, you're just looking for issues, uh, whatever. And that generally denies someone's argument. But in their case, looking for an issue is actually a good thing. That's progress. That's that's really moving forward, it is looking for issues to find and to, once again, solidify your existence. And if everything is sexist, if everything is actually racist, then your completely abstract concept of cultural Marxism, which generally dictates the fact that all things are relative, yada, 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 which is in itself debunks its own existence, but by doing so. But anyway, what it also manages to do is it creates this alternate reality for people whom of which aren't intelligent enough to realize that it actually debunks itself. And then it proceeds to institute itself in such a fashion that it tries to make everything fit its narrative, which is inherent to most ideologies, particularly the ones that practice dogmatism or any form of radical or re uh, revolutionary uh, tendencies. But with cultural Marxism, it actually, it, I notice it actually attempts to not just create the world around it, but it works on this process through time. And, and through time, it slowly begins to solidify its very existence. It begins to justify itself. Very much so like the radical ideologies of Nazism, where uh, pointing out the fact that Jews were here, Jews were there, and conveniently just alienating everything else to create this convenient worldview where Jews were responsible for everything. And... It couldn't possibly be a slightly more complex than just a grand Jewish conspiracy in the state of Austria or the what was left of the uh, German Empire after World War I. And I think it really points to the fact that this is solidification in, in many ways because it's attempting to solidify itself in reality. And if it can do that, if it can make everything, everything, shall we say, if it can create a parallel universe of thought within our very own reality, then it's more than a self-proving theory at that point. It is it is undeniable. No matter how much evidence, no matter how much fact you give, it doesn't matter. It still exists. It's, it's still there, even though you've disproved it, because those facts can be interpreted in different ways, which is always rather disturbing. And this is what you find also to conclude this more with how it interacts with the modern day narrative, if you take a look at something called modern journalism, if you don't know what that means, I encourage you to look it up on Wikipedia or obviously some slightly more legitimate sources, but Wikipedia is one place I found it to be, relatively speaking, um, a simple introduction. Modern journalism is this idea of valuing truth over fact, which sounds retarded when you really think about it because isn't the truth supposed to be fact? <laughs> like truth is supposed to be reality is it not and that's the problem truth is subjective fact is objective and this idea that we're going to value this whole connectivity is beyond dangerous for example um the modern day issue with uh, russia and the trump administration really outlines this very well it's this idea that all the facts have pointed to the, the reality that there's not a high likelihood that Donald Trump really had any conspiratorial or his campaign or his any of his campaign advisors or people who worked in his campaign had any actual legitimate contact with Russian sources in a way that actually influenced the election in a way that would have been illegal. Because keep in mind, countries influence elections all the time. Barack Obama commented on Brexit. Um, 
the CIA in I think the past 60 years has interfered with 80 elections worldwide. So it's not really uncommon. Obviously, the latter, uh, sorry, the early, no, the latter, the CIA was is clearly illegal. It's a violation of uh, national sovereignty and the democratic process and wherever these nations happen to exist. But the point is, the United States has a lovely track record of interfering with people's politics in countries where they really have no right to do so. And I think it highlights very well, at the end of the day, uh, this reality that whatever Russia did, it does not appear to be illegal in any fashion. It, any of the things that Russia is being accused of does not seem to be justifiable. On top of that, with the new Vault 7 leak from WikiLeaks, it shows that actually the CIA has a lovely tendency of actually fingerprinting, um, digitally fingerprinting Russia and Iran and North Korea and China for literally every hack they make. That's actually part of their policy, according to Vault 7, which its accuracy has not been disputed, actually. It's been, quite frankly, um, approved by many um, anonymous and ex-intelligent sources, uh, to my knowledge, including Edward Snowden. Say what you like about him, but he does have the qualifications to, in many ways, make a fairly sound judgment on that. And I think, really, at the end of the day, it boils down to the fact that it's the media's crusade of truth. It doesn't matter if the facts don't collaborate. They know it's got to be the case because there's no way Hillary Clinton could have lost. No way. Absolutely no way. Except for there is because <laughs> democracy, particularly a uh, democracy in a republic, which means you can't just treat people like crap and then treat certain people in like very particular locations fairly well because it appeals to their sense of uh, what is right and what is wrong. And that's what came and kicked Hillary Clinton in the butt. And the funniest thing is, is these people approved of the selection process and wanted Donald Trump to uh, submit to that uh, before the election results came in and then showed the fact that they were actually the ones who were losing. And then obviously they couldn't accept that. Just because I think it seems so absurd to them that the truth must be that there's something different. And this goes once again back into what I'm saying before. As people try to construe an alternate reality based on truth. So what must be real? Uh, what must be rational to them. And the problem is, is rationalization isn't fact. <laughs> it isn't fact at all. It doesn't mean you're right. That's kind of the problem with things like socialism and communism. They seem rational, and they are rational, until you analyze their base logic, what actually connects them to reality, and you find out those things are false, or not entirely true, entirely compatible. For example, the idea that we can all be sharing and caring like comes with uh, true communism. Um, this idea that we'll all live in peace, and we don't need actually government, uh, un under the ideas of Marx. And the reality is, is human beings don't work like that psychologically or biologically. There is clear scientific evidence to the contrary. Human beings don't work like that at all. It's impossible. It would never work. You would actually need to change human biology and human psychology in a way we still yet don't know how to actually do. Communism, inherently because of that, would never work. It, it can't. It won't. Human biology is essentially against it. But yet, the truth is that it must be possible. It, it has to exist. And the reality is the facts are not like that. But the rationalization is still there as long as you ignore the facts. And I think that's really why these people hate interacting with other individuals and why people who walk in to the whole ideology sphere find themselves very lost because in essence, you're dealing with a rationalization process that is actually fairly accurate. These people are educated for the most part they have a, a couple degrees under their belt sometimes, particularly in the social area when you start learning the arts and humanities. So these people are very educated when it comes to linking thought together, yet they aren't very good at linking it to reality, at least reality where it's real. So yeah, I guess that concludes really what I wanted to talk about. I, I know it was kind of a jumble and a mess, and hopefully I'll follow up on some things I didn't really cover, but... Yeah, hopefully you kind of got some wind of what the heck I'm about and going through. But yeah, uh, have a wonderful day and goodbye.